It is October 25th, 2024, and journalists are being targeted right now at an unprecedented rate. But they're not necessarily being targeted by the dictators that the U.S. would condemn. Now they're being targeted by the U.S. and its friends over in the U.K., or more specifically in Israel. In fact, Israel has killed over 130 journalists in the last year, targeting journalists in Gaza, the West Bank, and now in Lebanon, making it the deadliest period for journalists in decades, according to records from the Committee to Protect Journalists. But the targeting of journalists is not just happening in war zones. It's also happening in their own homes in the West. And that was the case for one journalist recently who woke up to the UK's counterterrorism police banging down his door as they proceeded to raid his home to seize his devices. Now, they haven't charged him yet, right? They haven't told them exactly why he was targeted other than to say that it was related to his social media posts. Yes, we are moving into an age where journalists are now being targeted for what they post on social media. I had the privilege to speak with this journalist earlier as he shared his story about what he went through, how he got to this point, and of course, the question of where things go from here. As the UK continues to use and abuse its counterterrorism laws, we discussed all the latest earlier, so let's take a listen to that conversation now. Joining me now to discuss is Asa winston Lee, an investigative journalist, associate editor at the Electronic Intifada, and author of Weaponizing Antisemitism. Asa, thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Thanks for having me. Now, I'm glad I get to talk to you. I heard about your story earlier this week, and I will say I was kind of shocked by it, right? This is every journalist nightmare. You mm. wake up before 6 a.m. in the morning to British counterterrorism police at your home, and they tell you that they have a warrant to search your house and vehicle for documents and devices. Will you start by taking us through what that experience was like, and what did they tell you about how they got to that point? Yes, well... Uh... On the latter question, not much. Um, it was a shocking experience. It wasn't surprising because it has happened before. It's happened to, especially over the last year, it's, ha it's been happening, happening to an increasing number of people in Britain, um, may, mainly Palestine Solidarity activists, especially people from Palestine Action. Their homes have been repeatedly raided. Palestine Action is a Palestine Solidarity group. A direct action group um, which they physically uh, go and they try and dismantle Israeli arms factories which are uh, which are based here in the United Kingdom um, there is about uh, I think there's eight left now because they have managed to shut down three facilities um, an office and two factories uh, that have gone out of business and they make drones the killer drones that Israel uses to annihilate Palestinians all over Palestine. Um, and, uh, you know, they've been very successful in their campaign. They haven't had a full victory yet, but they've been successful so far. Um, and, but the repression against them has ramped up a lot in the last year since the 7th of October, since the genocide started in Gaza. Um, and so that has increased. And I, I, in my journalism, I've been reporting on that. Um, but also since 7th of October 2023, that repression has increased to people who are not only taking direct action in that way, um, but people who are writing, people who are speaking. So activists, bloggers and increasingly journalists now. Um, obviously, there's a, you know, a continuum there. They're all uh, related. Um, so last year, I believe it was in December, and I reported in a, on it at the time, Tony Greenstein, a well-known uh, writer, blogger, and published author, uh, you know, a very well-known Jewish anti-Zionist um, campaigner who has written a lot about, um, he's written a book about the Zionist collusion with the Nazis during the Holocaust um, in the 1930s and 1940s during the Holocaust and, and the run up to the Holocaust, he was, he had all his, his home was raided, his devices were all seized and he was actually arrested. I wasn't arrested. Um, he, he was actually arrested and um, they initially, they, they imposed a bail condition on him, which um, banned him from posting to Twitter, to 2X, former Twitter. 
Um, and uh, the, thankfully, he man, you know his lawyer managed to get the, the latter part overturned. But you know his devices were all seized. Um, so yeah, so so I, it wasn't a total surprise to me, although it was a shocking experience. You try and prepare for it, um, but there's no way you can truly be prepared for for such a heavy handed experience. Yeah, I can imagine. And I'm wondering too, was there any? Did you know anything about? in a possible investigation? Was there any kind of heads up or was it like they came out of nowhere and then all of a sudden now they're telling you you're being investigated? Yeah, there was, there was no, there was no warning. There was nothing from the police. There was no, um, you know, there was, there was no phone call. There was, there was nothing. I mean, the whole idea and the idea of coming at 5 40 AM in the morning when it's still dark outside and you're still in your bed clothes, um, is to catch you unawares. I mean, this is the counter terror, what's called the counter terror command. They are not your everyday police. They're not the, they're not intelligence officers themselves. They're not MI5. So MI5 of course is the British equivalent to the, pro the closest equivalent in the US would probably be the FBI. Um, MI6 obviously being the, the overseas uh, British CIA as it were. Um, they're not so the counter terror command is not mi5 but they report to and uh you know coordinate with mi5 so these are very serious people um they haven't done this on a on a whim it is um and in fact at the end of the the, the police were here for uh, over three hours just over three hours in all about three and a half hours and uh, at the end i asked them why they'd done this and he wouldn't the senior officer wouldn't reveal why he would only say social media postings but refused to specify which but he did say it had been um in the works for over a year or something words words to that effect so this this is something that has has been planned for a long time and i i heard nothing from the police about it in advance no wow over a year that's it's just so alarming and i know i'm speaking about this as an american but i still have concerns about the police here in the U.S. doing mm. something similar, maybe not under the exact same laws as you're dealing with. Mm. But when it comes to the Terrorism Act, though, I'm curious about how that played a role in this, because they're talking about your social media posts. Now, they're not pointing to any specific one and saying, hey, you know, on October 6th at 4 p.m., you tweeted this and now we're going after that. But how do you think that your social media posts played a role in, I, I guess, them getting their eyes on you and kind of setting this new precedent in a way? Yeah, well, um, I uh, I mean, I've been taken through the relevant laws. Um, they actually, I mean, it was all kind of, uh, it was a bit more by the book than that has happened to previous people. So uh, there, there is an activist called Sarah Wilkinson who has a very large following on X and she posts and reposts uh, information and posts about the, the genocide in, in Gaza and she gets a, a huge amount of engagement there, which is, in my view, really one of the main reasons why she was targeted. Um, and she really, her, her home was totally ransacked by the Counter-Terror Command. Um, you know, this is a 61-year-old lady who... Um, you know, she's an activist for Palestine. It was very um, sort of thuggish with her. And they may have thought they could, because she's better known as a as an activist rather than a journalist, perhaps they thought, I mean, it's speculation on my part, but perhaps they thought um, as, as, a, as, a, as a more recognized journalist myself, they could get away with less. And so they weren't, like, they didn't smash anything up. They didn't ransack the place. They did a very serious search. They did the most thorough search of my office. They did some cursory searches of our of our bedroom, you know, pro, you know, personal, uh, you know, drawers and whatnot. Um, it's not. It's a very unpleasant experience. But they tried to give the appearance anyway of doing things by the book, where they were sort of ticking off each item they took and going through, going through it with me. But one of the more in, insidious things was that um they made it very clear from the outset that they wanted my devices that were used for my journalism they made it very clear and it, i have it in paperwork the paperwork they gave me they knew that i uh you know they they said the term they used was they were aware 
of my profession. So they know I'm a journalist. And I, I said to them, you know, <laughs> when I was still in my dressing gown, I said, you know, you're, I can't remember the exact phrase I used. I was still waking up, really. Um, it was, uh, you know, I said, you're doing this to a journalist. You shouldn't be doing this. This is, you're, you're, mm -hmm. You're trying to stop journalism, which is trying to prevent the genocide in Gaza, the Holocaust in Gaza. Um, and um, they, uh, so they wanted me to specify. Obviously, you know, it's a household. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of devices in, in the household. They could belong to anyone in the household. And so the implied threat though, was that they would take all the devices if I didn't sort uh... of cooperate to an extent and, and that they would ransack the place. They didn't say that explicitly they didn't say we're gonna you know smash everything up but i knew that they they'd done that with um sarah wilkinson and so you want to try and de-escalate the situation they've got all the power you know they've got the power they've taken over the house um you know they didn't physically smash in the door i i opened up for them but they, i had but i i really i had to i had no choice really you know they were very um they were banging on the door saying police open up etc cetera, etc cetera. so you try and calm the situation down and so uh, after i was able to speak to a lawyer to my lawyer um before um they were able to search the house um and after seeking legal advice i decided to cooperate with them to a to a minimal extent um mm -hmm. the thing i did say no comment to was that when they asked me for the pin codes and passwords for each device i said no comment um, and, um, we, you know, we are now trying to, me and my legal team are now trying to get, stop the police accessing the devices, copying anything on the devices, really touching them in any way. You know, we, we do not want the police or the intelligence services or the Israeli intelligence services mm -hmm. who we know, um, the British state collaborates with to, to access anything to endanger my sources in any way. We're doing everything we can to stop that from happening. So, um, you know, we're taking all legal means we can we can to do that. Um, in terms of the law, um, you know, I really need to sit down and and, and uh, increase my understanding of the laws. Like they um, they actually um, this relates to what I was saying about it being sort of by the book, as it were, because they even printed had printed out the relevant laws to me or relevant sections. Oh, wow of the laws um there is a there's the terrorism act 2000 and the terrorism act 2006 and they claim that i may be in violation that my social media posts may have been in violation of those laws so you know it's uh it's a long long running issue in britain the the anti the so-called anti-terror laws have been used to really uh chill free speech for a long time to an extent that it wouldn't, you know, I'm not saying the United States is a, is a paragon of free speech and, and so forth. Um, we know that there there is very uh, severe oppression that happens in the United States, but I think it works in different ways in the United States. It tends to be more through uh, corporations that this kind of, you know, like the social media platforms that we, we use and that we rely on um, so much for, for everyday work and uh, journalism and so forth because they're private entities they can really uh they tend to really choose what they can what, what we can and can't publish on there um in britain though we don't have a first amendment guaranteeing free speech and so anti-terror laws have over the years been used increasingly to repress free speech to to chill uh independent journalism um but you know we're not gonna we're not gonna take it lying down we're not going to allow them to access uh, our my devices or to um, endanger my sources in any way, at least not without a fight. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you bring that part up because I know that, you know, as a journalist, right, part of your livelihood is your devices, your ability to write articles on your computer or, you know, to have your phone, that sort of thing. But then you also have your sources who you're protecting, doing everything yeah. you can. And to think that exactly as you were saying, you've got the police there. Well, they have a quick line to Israel. So I'm sure Israel's looking at you. They're like, this is a guy who's speaking up for the Palestinians, who's speaking up about the 
ongoing genocide and the fact that not only is Israel carrying it out, yes, but the US and the UK are enabling it and making it possible. And mm -hmm. to target you in this way, I mean, it's sending a message to every other journalist around you that this could be you next, you could be the next person to be raided. And it's just incredibly concerning all around. Now, when it comes to, so you go, they come, they're there for over three hours, they take your devices. Was there any communication on, okay, this is how long the investigation is going to last? I mean, you weren't arrested, mm. but you also haven't been charged yet. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, it's a strange situation because it, in most of the cases, well, I think in all of the cases that I'm aware of that have previously happened, uh, the individuals concerned had been arrested. So, and then and then sort of de-arrested or, you know, a, a bail condition imposed and then released and then they've sort of kept the possibility of them being charged in the future kind of hanging over their heads as a possibility but uh for the most part that hasn't really happened there has been some charges in the case of the palestine action activists yeah i i they no they didn't really i mean look it's still early days it's still only a week since it's happened so uh you know i have an excellent legal team and we're challenging this in all ways possible protecting my sources in all ways possible and we hopefully will learn more soon um and we're going to fight this all the way um we don't know whether this is the end it could be the end it could just be a simple harassment um and y you know uh that's sort of the end of it because sort of wave goodbye to the devices um they you know things are obviously very encrypted and so forth and it's not so simple for them to just get access to everything uh, that which is why they're obviously asking for pin codes and passwords which i refused to give um so we don't know if it's the beginning or if it's the end as i said like so it, you know it's it's possible this is just the start and there could be some sort of uh indeterminate uh legal action we don't know yet but um either way we'll fight it all the way it's uh it's been quite humbling that i mean the silver lining of all of this is it the amount of support that's come from people has been quite humbling because uh people are really outraged at this and how it's escalating you know it's, it's uh it's uh it, and it's not just in britain obviously in western europe especially um and, and north america too although as you said it works in different ways in North America, different laws and so forth. Um, but I think it's a, it's a threat increasingly to journalists um, as well as activists. And I think that there must be a lot of people in Britain, especially right now, asking them who's going to be next, asking themselves who's who's going to be next. Yeah, that's the thing. They they look at you and they go, okay, if you can be accused of, you know, inciting terrorism for your post on social media, which also goes back to your work as a journalist. I mean, as journalists, we have to use social media. That's just part of the world that we live in right now. And I thought it was interesting because I, when I was looking into the articles that you have written, especially recently for the electronic intifada, they talk about not just the ongoing genocide, but also the UK's role, right? The UK's arms exports to Israel that are used in committing this genocide. You also talked about the influence of former MP George Galloway, who speaks out in support of Palestine and has really been a, a thorn in the side of the political class there, I'm glad to say. And <laughs> when it comes to the, the work that you've done, I mean, what are your concerns moving forward and ha has this had any impact on your work aside from you know making it more difficult and now making you almost kind of look over your shoulder at every turn wondering what's going to happen next i think obviously it takes a while to rebuild from these things you know especially in this technological age we're so reliant on our devices our phones and and so forth especially for everyday life right it, even outside of journalism. Obviously, I mean, I have access to my archive, my journalistic archive, my contacts, but I've reestablished access to my archive, my contacts book and so on and so forth. So I can continue my work. You know, I just did a new post on my Substack today, just thanking everybody for their support and updating people on the latest. You know, and <laughs> I had people turn literally turn up on my doorstep to bring me a new phone oh. and <laughs> and, and laptop unsolicited which was actually quite moving um 
so it's uh yeah it's been a, a very surreal again it's only only just over a week um it's been a very strange and surreal experience and and the silver lining is the outpouring of support i guess um yeah. but you know it, it's a blow there's no doubt it's a blow psychological blow uh, a practical blow it takes a while to re-establish everything. You know, you have to log back into everything. You have to get your passwords. You have to do that. There's a lot of admin that I have had to do and that I'm still going to have to continue to do. But that's OK. You know, ultimately, in the end, I will I will come back stronger from this um, and uh, we will carry on. And I think the problem for the British state in the same way that the problem for the Israeli state has been in Palestine is neither entity is doing any real strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. The, 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 uh, I mean, thankfully for us, I suppose, right. And thankfully for the Palestinians in the long term, they are not, they're only thinking for their, for the immediate term. So the, the analogy I've been making in interviews is that the Israelis only plan is to kill, is to kill and kill and kill, is to kill Palestinians, is to kill civilians, uh, to kill Lebanese civilians, to kill resistance leaders, to kill journalists, to kill children, to kill men, to kill fathers, to kill women. It's just kill and kill and kill. That is literally the doctrine of um, the former Israeli prime minister's uh, planner, Arnon Sofa, kill and kill and kill in Gaza. Um, but there's no strategic thinking for the future. There's no thought of the fact that if they kill Yahya Sinwar today, there will be new Yahya Sinwars who rise to take his place. If they kill uh, the journalists as they have been doing, and just this week, just uh, yesterday, they put out a, a kill list of six new Palestinian journalists in northern Gaza, the last few remaining journalists with Al Jazeera, um, in northern Gaza, as Israel carries out the full annihilation of northern Gaza, they are openly declaring on social media that they're going to kill these six six men. Um, and the, the Western supporters, the Western government supporters are allowing them to do this. They're not challenging it. Um, so their only plan is to kill. But they're neglecting the fact that new people will rise to take their place more palestine there will be more journalists there will be more fighters there will be more um writers and so it, israel is just setting itself up for problems in the future same in lebanon and it's the same here you know the british it, it, not the same but it's very it's similar dynamic here um it, you know they took all my computers uh, they took my phone, they took the tools of my trade. Um, but what has happened in the week since, there's been a massive outflowing of support for me, a massive outflowing of support for the electronic intifada, who, you know, who I, who my, I spend most of my time writing and reporting for. Um, and it's it's been uh, brilliant in that way. Um, and it has increased awareness of our journalism um, one of the last article that I wrote before this happened was a long investigative piece called How Israel Killed Hundreds of Its Own People on the 7th of October. Um, and it was about the Hannibal Directive, which allows uh, an Israeli military doctrine, which allows it to kill its own soldiers in the event of their capture, of their imminent capture by uh, Palestinian or other Arab resistance fighters. And how that doctrine was extended on October 7, 2023, to Israeli civilians, non combatants who were captured by Palestinian fighters on October 7th, on their way to Gaza when they were captured, when they were captured and being taken back to Gaza, the military doctrine was reactivated and the order was issued to the Gaza division not a single vehicle can return to Gaza. And so all these vehicles were bombed from the air by israel itself which explains the high number of civilian israeli civilian dead on october 7th because the palestinian uh, fighters insisted and their leadership insisted that they weren't they were primarily targeting military targets um in terms of in terms of uh, deadly force 
Um, although they also did say that they captured and detained um, some as well as Israeli soldiers, some Israeli non-combatants. And so, but the intent was to keep them alive and to exchange them for Palestinian prisoners. And Israel didn't want that to happen. Sorry, that was quite a long diversion from the from the point. But it, it's like it's uh, it's this article. It was very popular at the time when I released it on October the 7th, 2024, the anniversary, obviously. Um, but now it's gone viral again after what's happened to me because people want to know. Anytime you try and censor something, it, it has the effect online of um, increasing interest in it. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I hear about a banned book, I'm interested in it. <laughs> right. All of a sudden, exactly. That's an excellent point. And yeah, I'm with you. I So often, especially over the last year, I've looked at Israel and gone, okay, what is the strategy here, right? You just kill as many Palestinians as you can, clearly, but then you continue to to bring this violence, this level of violence to the rest of the region. They're not going to want you to exist anymore in the future and that's just going to lead to more and more conflict and that you know continues to threaten israel because of what they have done to themselves here and i i'm with you when it comes to what the uk is doing now yeah all of a sudden now we're talking about their counterterrorism laws and we're talking about the concerns that this raises for journalists like yourself who are now being targeted in just such a ridiculous way. Now, we'll continue to follow your case and where this goes from here, but for anyone who's watching and they're interested in finding out more about your work, will you tell us where we can find you online? Sure, yep. I, I have a sub stack where I, um, I post, uh, I, I repost all my articles um, and I also uh, post my appearances on other podcasts uh, and, uh, you know, other media outlets. I've just done an update about... Uh, thanking all my subscribers and supporters, obviously, about what's happened. Uh, the main outlet that I write for where I'm an associate editor and investigative journalist is Electronic Intifada. Um, so the first, you can go to asawinstanley.substack.com and Electronic Intifada is electronicintifada.net. Awesome. And I will make sure that those links are posted below. Aza Wynn Stanley, an investigative journalist, associate editor at the Electronic Intifada, and author of Weaponizing Anti Semitism. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Thanks, Rachel. If anything in this video resonated with you, be sure to like it, share it with your friends, leave a comment, and as always, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to keep up with all of my work, make sure that you're subscribed to my page on Substack. That's rachelblevins.substack.com. That's also where you can find weekly episodes of my new series available for paid subscribers called Sanctioned. You can also find Sanctioned over on my page on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Rachel Blevins. That's where you can join the community there and participate in regular polls and Q&As. As always, thank y'all so much for all of your support, and I'll see you next time.